Welcome to 2020 Politics War Room with James Carville, who's in New York this week. I'm Al Hunt here in Washington, D.C. at American University, who's our partner in this wonderful podcast. We partner with the Sign Institute. We have some really great guests to get to in just a minute. But first, let me ask you to please subscribe, rate, and review 2020 Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. All right, James, we like before any primary or caucus to go to the go-to person uh, in that state. And in South Carolina, the go-to person about politics, particularly Democratic politics, is Antoine Seawright, who is with us right now, was a CBS analyst in that debate last night. So let me just start off, Antoine. Did that debate change anything for Saturday's primary? I don't know if it changed people's minds. I think it gave undecided uh, voters um, something to think about. I definitely think it gave people, states who are already early voting, uh, Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, Wisconsin, uh, California. I think it gave those voters a better look uh, at what the conversation and the temperature is like among the candidates. Uh, but I also think it probably um, changed some people. Uh, if you look at what Michael Bloomberg was able to do and how he was able to recover, if you look at how Bernie Sanders was able to defend uh, himself uh, when the assault came his way, if you look at the reemergence uh, of Joe Biden's uh, candidacy last night during the debate, I think that those things kind of changed some people's hearts about this process. Well, let me ask you about Biden, because the polls, he always has been uh, in front in South Carolina over half the electorate there on Saturday. He's expected to be African-American. That's a, 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 a voters that he usually does very well with, but he's been slipping. Uh, he had, a, by I, all accounts, a strong debate performance last night, uh, and he got the endorsement today of Jim Clyburn, who's probably the most influential African-American in South Carolina or most any other state. Uh, I don't know if endorsements matter. I particularly don't know if they matter with young voters. But give me your take on it. Is 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 Joe Biden uh, has he stopped the slippage and is he back on the ascendancy, particularly with African American voters? I think I think South Carolina has always been Vice President Biden's to lose. Uh, I think that uh, you know you call it slippage. I think it's just an example of the ebbs and flows of politics. Uh, and then, you know, you have to look at where the ebbs and the flows happen uh, and, and who it happens with. I would be concerned if I were the Biden campaign, if older African American voters were starting to go a different direction. I don't see that. Uh, younger voters, they're very fluid. They're not as likely uh, to show up in the primary. So it, it's a little different. Uh, so I think Biden is still to lose. I do think black people. Uh, in South Carolina are going to demonstrate what's very important to the African American community as a whole, and that's loyalty. Uh, and I think that trust, relatability, reliability matter uh, in the environment, that political environment that we're in. And so, as a result, that's so why I think Joe Biden is going to be successful. So, so let, let's. I want to explore this a little bit, a little bit more. But Al alluded to it. You, you really talked about it. And when a lot of people look at African-American voters, for whatever reason, see something monolithic. And I, I think young African-Americans, just like young Jews or young Latinos or young anything, have a, a little different view of the world than, than their parents and grandparents had. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, I, my grandparents were sharecroppers. So as a result, the way the lens in which we see the world and the way we participate in our democracy is different. I think that's playing out in this election. We're starting to see a real shift in not just the narrative, but a shift in kind of the um, what's important to communities and what that looks like. So, so if I were running for governor of South Carolina, and, it, and you're my advisor, I, and I, I said, Anton, I, I really want to try to break in in to the younger African-American community? What, what, are there some issues or, or things that they're really more passionate about than their parents? Or, what, what's your analysis of that? Yeah, I think the issues are different. Um, but yet, yeah, some of them are still the same. I still think quality of life issues are important. Um, but quality of life issues for my grandparents and my parents were different from them. They did not go to anybody's college. I went to two colleges with two degrees. And so student loan debt is definitely a critical thing. Uh, healthcare, all of the things that are important to older voters 
are important to younger voters. It's just how we message it and where we communicate these messages to is the difference between pass and fail in this party. Uh, and we have to meet voters where they are. We can't make the assumption that people who show up in polls uh, play ball at all at the same level. There are people who cannot name their U.S. senator, state senator, or uh, any member of Congress, but they show up and vote. Uh, and I think we have to keep in mind that every person is an eligible voter if they're registered. And if they're not registered, you have a responsibility to register. Right. So, you're, as I can, from the inflection of your voice and everything, I think you, you, you have the judgment right now that Biden's going to probably win in South Carolina on Saturday. I, I do think he's going to win. Um, I, I know some people are going to say he has a big win and this, that, and the third. Um, however, I, I equate politics and sports together often. And I love the Laker era when they were winning championships. And I love the Miami Heat era and I love the Chicago Bulls era. And I cannot tell you one of those times which I remember what the score was for the championship game was they decide the game. And so I say all that to say I'm not sure score matters. Uh, a win is a win, and the only thing people are going to remember is they won. Well, I think it's an excellent point. The only time a win wasn't a win was when – when uh, James Carville spun the New Hampshire primary in 1992, that a second place was uh, was a great victory. But then not very many people have the skill to do that. So I think you're right, uh, Anton. A win is a win. And and that raises the question of one other candidate, Tom Stiers. Tom Stiers spent a lot of money in South Carolina. He has really gone after the black vote. He spent a lot of money in Nevada, too, and was doing fairly well in the polls. He put all of his eggs in the Nevada and South Carolina basket. The eggs did not crack in Nevada. We'll yet to see what happens in South Carolina. I think the fight is for second place between he and Bernie Sanders uh, here in the state, but it could be a big gap in between the second and third place person. And and some of his votes would be more likely to go to to, to Biden if you if they if they peel off. I think they, I think he's going to push uh, the conversation, but pull support from several different places. And as a result, I don't think you can pinpoint one place where he will have some sort of effectiveness. Let me say that. Well, let's go, let's project out to, to Super Tuesday. And, you know, the Eastern time zone is going to really count. And California, I'm told, is just going to take a long time to, like, count all of its votes. Yeah. So I think we got, I know we got North Carolina. We got Virginia. I think we got Tennessee in the South. Yeah, Tennessee. Uh, Alabama. Alabama, African-American voters are going to play a large part in the early, at, at, at least the early reporting of Tuesday, Tuesday uh, next week after South Carolina. And, you know, we're getting ready to find out that the Democratic Party is very much a party, you know, that is not like it's being portrayed sometimes in the media or not that it's sometimes being portrayed in places like Iowa and New Hampshire. I mean, the people that are going to start to vote now are real Democrats, and they're going to have a real, 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 real thing in there. And I think that South Carolina is important for Biden because it, it'll give him a, a aura of a winner and that we're not just wasting our vote. we got something going here, and I, I hope, you know, maybe he can parlay this into something bigger. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think he will. Look, I think that while people give Nevada credit for being diverse, it is not more diverse from a totality standpoint than South Carolina. Only 10 percent, I think, of Nevada is African-American, 30 percent Latino, 25 percent Latino. Well, in South Carolina, 61 percent of the people who are going to cast their vote Saturday, uh, well, who are going to cast their vote in this election between um, in-person absentee and uh, voting on Election Day, 61 percent African-American, 55 percent women. When you look at the states that follow South Carolina on the calendar, most of those states are very flirtatious uh, to the demographics of South Carolina. So uh, we'll, we'll see. I think we'll start to see this process reset. Uh, it's all a math game. 54 delegates will be awarded in South Carolina. Uh, they're going to be split, obviously. Uh, so we're going to see this process reset, and I think, who is able to create and gather and transfer momentum, which will uh, arguably lead to more money, which means to more uh, more messaging, uh, will be positioned to be successful.
Yeah. The other thing is that if, if, if I think, James, you would agree on this, that if Biden does win in South Carolina, there's a lot of talk about he doesn't have any resources for Super Tuesday, which he doesn't. Uh, but you get something that may be better than resources. You get something called free media. Uh, and if you get a bump for two or three days of free media, uh, you know, particularly in those southern states you talked about, but maybe even in a California, Texas, uh, that's going to be as good, if not better, than uh, all the money that uh, Bernie. Oh, and I'll tell you what, in election night, uh, I, what do you think? So let's, let's assume Biden wins. All right, at home, you want to set an over-under, all right? That means that, you know, what percent of the faces in the shot when Biden comes out will be African-American? Oh. Because that's the shot that's, that, that's the shot that's people are going to see, all right? That's the shot that's going to matter. And how good they are is, you know, they got to kick. They got to kick some people. Get out the way. No, I don't want you on there, Tiffany. You know, <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying 68. What's your over under? You've got too many donors, probably 62. <laughs> Antoine, you want to take an over under? I'm going to say 67. Oh, uh, wow. Well, we're going to try to count. on. on. <laughs> yeah. Because the biggest thing he's going to have is that shot. That's going to be in the newspapers. That's going to be on the local news. It's going to be on the national news. It's going to be on Face, Facegram or Instabook or whatever the hell else they got out there. That's going to be the money shot right there. And they got to plan the shot. I mean, if I was managing that campaign, I, you know, I'd have somebody really smart saying, okay, you know, this and that. And don't, and don't let this guy, you know, I, this big, hey, this is one of our big donors, our big bundles. Okay, he, he can get in the shot, but that's it. <laughs> right. You know, before but before we go, this is something James uh, I know feels strongly about. I do, too. One thing that was kind of stunning last night about that debate, Antoine, it took an hour and seven minutes for any candidate, it was Mike Bloomberg, to bring up the coronavirus. This is a, an epidemic that threatens the whole country, and it was only one question. Were, were you surprised, and did you get any reaction afterwards as why it was almost a non-topic last night? No, I think that most people were so early on we're trying to set the tone uh, and the temperature for the rest of the debate so that means kind of pulling a mike tyson a jab and go at each other until i don't think issues were a priority i think it was all about emotions keep in mind we love to talk about issues and i'm not saying it's not important but emotions runs the day in the era of donald trump politics that's why he's president and so i think it was uh, probably not intentional but became uh, intentional um because they were so focused on how to jab at each other and separating each other on issues that um, that will supersede, perhaps, the impact of the coronavirus. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was... You talk about a kitchen table issue. You talk about something that coronavirus, it don't know billionaires from, you know, homeless people. It, it, don't, know, it don't know color. It doesn't know sexual orientation. It don't know shit. It's just, you know, it's something that going to be a dominant issue here in American politics and American, I'm not to mention American health for a, apparently some chance for some time. I don't know. I'm not an expert on it, no, anything about it, but I do know that it's going to have a, if, if it goes as some people are saying that it, it, it could, it's going to have an enormous impact on American politics. Yeah. And it was a chance to take a really legitimate shot at Donald Trump, uh, which I think, you know, brought it into the political sphere last night. But anyway, Hey, Antoine, you have got a very busy, uh, what, uh, uh, 72 hours coming up. Uh, you know, someone said this is the 4th of July and you sell firecrackers for a living. So, uh, you know, go out of Antoine and uh, we'll keep talking to you. Thank you, man. I appreciate you being on. Hey, James, our next guest. I mean, we just keep upgrading. Amy Dacey. Amy was the CEO of the Democratic National Committee. We never had a CEO on before. Uh, she was with the John Kerry campaign in 2004, was the executive director of Emily's List. And for all those important jobs she, she has had, she's now reached the peak. She is the executive director of the Sign Institute of Public Policy at American University, which is kind enough to host us uh, every week. We think uh, AU, Amy, is probably the third greatest university in America, behind only LSU and Wake Forest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're pl proud to be a part of that group. <laughs> well, thank you for being with us. Uh, put on your old hat 
as the CEO and, and uh, involved in politics at the DNC. You had to think about what happens if there's a, what we used to call a brokered convention, if no one has a majority going into the Democratic National Committee. For years, journalists have dreamed about it. Politicians have dreaded it. But let's, let's take a hypothetical, which may not be crazy. Uh, and that is at the end of June, Bernie Sanders has 30, 35 percent of the delegates that Joe Biden has come back with South Carolina and, you know, is hanging in there. Mike Bloomberg's money matters everywhere. And Pete Buttigieg, who has seems to have some staying power between the three of them, they have 60, 65 right. percent. What happens then? Well, I mean, that's the interesting part, because for the party about 50 years ago, they gave up a lot of the responsibility for the nominating, you know, part of it. And so we've kind of opened up the process. You have these primaries and caucuses that have a say, and then suddenly there's this delegate count. I think that the rules change certainly every time after. I mean, you and James know well, we have a commission after every election. And so some of the rules change. The interesting part, you know, for the convention in 2020 is that the rules have changed that that first ballot does have the traditional superdelegates. So we might not have consensus. And if there's not consensus on the ballot for the first time in, you know, decades, you might have a second vote, which would be unique. Um, are you know, and, and the rules and the call to action of the Democratic National Committee are prepared for that, but it's also unprecedented for a while. And so. the superdelegates are members of Congress, members of the right. DNC, party leaders. governors and party leaders. Correct. Who were stupidly excluded from the first ballot. Uh, well, it was a concession that was certainly made after the 2016 election, and there was a lot of controversy about how that they were unpledged and they could, you know, make decisions. They certainly played a factor in, you know, um, 2008. You saw that Hillary Clinton had a large number of the superdelegates kind of going in, and as the delegate count changed and as we got closer, some of them peeled off and went to Barack Obama. So when you went into that convention, you had more of a, you know, consensus on where they were. And you don't didn't also have the unique thing is this ideological divide that would maybe make some people hold on to their delegates in a way that's different and some delegates wouldn't feel less comfortable going to another candidate. You know, I would think under that scenario, and then I want to turn it over to James, under that scenario, which is not crazy, it may not be probable, but it's not crazy, that and you get to the superdelegates and the second ballot, that it would be advantage Biden because they know him uh, as opposed to uh, Mike Bloomberg, as opposed to Pete Buttigieg. They may know Bernie, but they may fear Bernie. Uh, and just, again, it, I, a lot can happen. But if you get to that second ballot in superdelegates, that's, that would seem to under this scenario, provide an advantage to Biden? Well, they were put in the system as, a, for lack of a better term, as a peer review almost, so right. that, you know, established party leaders. Businesses. Yes, exactly. And so, yes, it would seem that the, the, the you know, thought behind that would be it would go with a more established candidate, a more party, you know, person who's had a long history with the party. Um but there's also a lot of elected leaders that within that that might be in the more progressive wing of the party. I'm, I'm not sure. But you also see, even though they're not on the first ballot, certainly candidates have been using them for the momentum factor um, in the beginning of this campaign. So you saw in South Carolina, you know, suddenly Congressman Clyburn is endorsing Joe Biden. You know, he might not be voting till the second ballot, but he'll matter for momentum. And so in a way, superdelegates still matter. They might not matter in the delegate count on that first ballot, but they matter in the momentum game. So, so uh, first of all, I'm, you can imagine that I, I, I want the party to win in November, and I do not think that Bernie Sanders is the best vehicle to achieve that. And I think as we go forward to the convention, there's only one thing that counts, and that's 1,900, I think, in 91. That's, that's what, the number of delegates you need. I, I get asked this all the time. Shouldn't Steyer or Klobuchar or Buttigieg or, Bloom, or whoever get out the race? Does how does this affect in the way the delegates are counted? Do we want do we want to pair this field down to, to two or three people? Or is it okay if, if, if some of them stay in a little bit longer? Because that, that's the number one question I get. I, I'd understand if we were just trying to get votes, let everybody stay in as long as they want to, because, you know, it, it, all you're trying to do is stop Bernie from getting to 50. But here you can you can do a lot with under 50. So that that's the nature of my question. If you could comment on it, please. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, James, the big piece is that we've got so few delegates actually counted. I mean, I think in the media and otherwise, it makes it sound like we've had these huge delegate battles. We haven't yet. I think after Super Tuesday is when people will ask that calculation. Certainly, you'll see candidates doing the math. And if they don't have a path anymore, should they, you know, um, come together? I think the interesting thing, too, is this is another question that's been debated a lot in the party. We have proportional, um, you know, decisions in, in the delegate count where you see Republicans have a winner take all when it comes to their delegates. So does that, you know, uh, keep this process going a lot longer, too, because they are proportionally given? You saw in New Hampshire, you have people battling about who the, who won, who won. But then you've got Pete Buttigieg getting the same actual delegate count as a Bernie Sanders. So I think that influences the system, too. I think after Super Tuesday, there's also going to be some a lot more pressure from people on some of these candidates to try and, and uh, pare down the thing. Yeah, the money. Money will be a big factor, right, too? It might not be their choice. Sure. Right. A lot of people, I mean, once you start this, you, you kind of don't want to get out. You think, well, I got a hope here and this, I can do that. But what's going to happen is they don't, don't I, you know, Joe Biden only had a million dollars worth of TV buys on Super Tuesday. He'll probably raise some money based on his performance last night, but he's not flushing cash either. Right. I think that that the resources question is going to lend a big question to where where they're going to go. Now, I also think, though, the influence of low dollar fundraising has created a system that people can hit their email list and maybe stay in for one more contest. You know, like some Buttigieg. of these. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, can you use that to leverage one more contest, one more? But I think you're right. I think some of these resources, people are going to start thinking about where they want to put, you know, their money to to because I do think there's a consensus, a beat Trump consensus in a lot of the Democratic Party. So you're going to want to see a strong nominee. So you follow Democratic politics. You obviously follow it in, intensely close and have been, you know, instrumental in that senior. Let's talk a little bit about Milwaukee, right? That that didn't seem like a very smart decision that we made. <laughs> First of all, I'm told that the California delegation is going to be at the O'Hare Hilton. I can tell you, that's not going to work well, stuffing these people in buses and going for right, you know, right. God knows what. You know, it's like 90 miles. It's going to take forever to get up there during the convention. Um, but we're there. And I, I have a fear we're looking at 1968 in Chicago again. I really do. Do you have any – does that thought cross your mind? Well, I mean, I think <laughs> – this is the challenge. Like you've you've got certainly also a month in between the you know Democratic and Republican convention. Like you want to use these because we haven't had this delegate challenge in so long. They're more of a media show and they're more of a getting your message out and being have the, have this strong unity thing you know coming out of it. It's always interesting where we pick. Um, when I ran the site the delegate or site selection committee and did the you know master contract negotiation, you look at. You know, things like uh, certainly security, you look at logistics, you know, you look at so it hotels. is interesting. Yeah. And hotels and everything. But it's also a challenge. You know, there's there's two camps, too, that say, like, do you want to be in a state that actually matters and is a part of the decision making process? You know, that, that's an argument that goes in one end out there. It doesn't matter if you have it in North Carolina, you can have it in Utah. Maybe some may have it in Salt Lake City. You know, weather's good that time of year, and, you know, they got a nice airport. Beautiful view. <laughs> you know, I mean, Salt Lake City would make more sense than, than Milwaukee would make. And you're not going to get one vote. It does not matter at all. No one is going to vote for you on a convention site. Yeah, and I think that's why those other factors should matter. So the logistics having not been a part of the Milwaukee decision, again, it's going to be challenging because a lot of these are picked for, you know, media reasons, I think, and, you know, to do this. But we're running into a possibility of having it be an actual party meeting, an actual place where you're going to have to do party business to pick the nominee and several ballots. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, what comes out of uh, the decision to be in Milwaukee, then also the process in Milwaukee. You know, you think about people producing the convention. They usually set it up like we're going to do this video. We're going to do this. video. You know, like if it's a contested convention, there's going to be a lot around the credentials committee, the rules committee. You know, um, I, I can't even imagine being on the platform committee. I mean, this this is could be a very robust, you know, uh, uh, you know, between all of those. The credentials challenges alone could create quite a well, situation. Well, the other thing, Amy, you picked up on something. The closest we've come to a brokered convention was 1976, the Republicans in Kansas City with Reagan and Ford, which I did cover. And the one thing the Reagan people knew from the beginning was, you know, we don't care about platform, you know, whatever. What we and the Ford people, rules, rules are what matter. And if you can change the rules 
which you can. You can create new requirements. Back then, they said the president has to pick a vice president on Tuesday night. So that automatically loses some, you know, they might try to do something like that this time. Ken, after that first, you know, delegates aren't bound. I mean, they're supposed to be bound, but there's no law that says a delegate can't say, I've changed my mind. Uh, uh, and, and how are they going to rule on that? And uh, there's the rules will matter more than some credentials will certainly matter if there's a fight. But the platform will get a lot of attention, but... You know, it doesn't matter much. Yeah, and I think a lot of the candidates will use that to try and influence their their just being in the race and the issues they care about. But those committees have a big responsibility when you're looking at, you know, a contested, you know, primary if we come to a close delegate count. But I think, James, you and your team knew this better than anybody. Like, changes in this system, the nomination system, have really created changes in the strategy. I mean, it's the calendar that drives this. It's the decision about superdelegates or not, um, proportional versus winner-take-all representation. Presentation, like, you know, the Rules Committee meets for, you know, the year and decides a year ahead of time what this is all going to look like. And so these candidates right now are gaming out like the rest of the calendar and what that's going to look like. And those decisions were made a year ago. And so that's also the challenge heading into Milwaukee for a lot of these candidates to figure out what their strategy is to get to that 1991. I think we decided it was. Uh, yeah, you know, Democratic Democrats, they, they love to write rules and they love to arcane <laughs> and they love well we don't do this so we don't include this you forgot how you gonna what about that and so california said you know there are two things that democrats complain about is money in politics and the fact that california is so late so the way that we fix it is we put california really early which of course does have something to do with money in politics i promise you that i i think it's absolutely right and then a long time ago when you saw the Democrats institute the window rule and put together this between May, March and June, you know, you had to have all the contests to try and make sure you had time for the general election. You saw these states, you know, the tradition of Iowa and New Hampshire and like, you know, the, the challenge is people who win like have a certain, you know, affinity for whatever brought you, you know, to the nomination. So these states kind of stay in the forefront. But also, I don't think the penalties like, I mean, even if we look at after 2020, are Iowa and New Hampshire sure going to give up their first in the nation status if they get hand slapped that their delegates don't count. I mean, this is going to be big conversations even after the convention about what's the future of the calendar. Um, and that's the interesting place. It's some of those rules where the few places where the, the Republicans and Democrats come to consensus to try and figure out, you know, um, their nominating processes, you know, on that. And the favorite guessing game among among pundits and reporters is if there's a broker convention, who will be the brokers? And the answer is we really don't know. I, I will predict that one broker of sorts uh, or having a disproportionate amount of influence will be the Speaker of the House uh, just because she commands such respect from so many elements of the party. I don't know what that means. Uh, I am convinced that she doesn't want Bernie Sanders at the head of the ticket because she's going to lose a number of those 41 freshman Democrats. Uh, and I don't know how you exercise uh, that influence there. But certainly if you get into that kind of situation, uh, she'll be one of the people who will play some kind of a role. I think it's interesting because the chair of the actual convention that's named, a lot of times it had a very ceremonial role or an honorary role and, and certainly had responsibilities at the convention. But if you go into a convention where you're going to have several votes, this this role matters a great deal. And I do think that it'll be interesting, like who in our party leaders are out there who haven't had an opinion or who haven't you know, stated that they have a preference of who that will be are the ones to actually broker that. And I, and I think that'll be an interesting part of it. So, so is Pelosi the, by na the chairman of the convention by as a result of her position? I, it's it's my understanding is that it's named that way until an official chair is named, and they and according to the call, which is basically the rule book, you know, for the convention, um, one of the first things is the you know the the nomination of the the official chair of the convention. So how much power does, does that chair have, like on challenges and you know all of the stuff that we're going to see. I think it's like in the past it hasn't, you know, it's like I said, it's been ceremonial. But if you're sitting there in the credentials committee um, and the chairs of that committee are hearing all of them and, you know, if there's even not consensus coming out of that, certainly the chair of the convention is going to have a lot to say to direct that and especially the rules and how many votes. We haven't done this right. in I'm so long. So, before, but 
And right. And, and when you look at the rule book, it's got like two pages, I think, designated to to actually how many how you do votes. So, you know, like you said, we like to write rules, but there are also like a lot of interpretation, I think, in some of those. So I think, again, people will play the advantage game and to say interpret the rules to what they want to see happen. It's, it's more to, uh, who interprets the rule and who writes the rule. Right. And exactly. I, it just would, but, you know, and who has if, if she has the ultimate authority, mm-hmm. you know, if there's a dispute of which there are going to be a 100 of them, I promise right. you. Right. Right. If she's resolving them, it'll make me very happy. Yeah. Because she has a hundred percent influence over what I think. If we get to Milwaukee without a right. Without a well, nominee. just as somebody who watches and observes her in the house and how she negotiates all all those votes and you know what's happening, I think that there's a lot of that that can translate well to leading some of these challenges maybe at the convention. I think James and I have a total consensus on we would prefer Nancy Pelosi over Tom Perez <laughs> to run the Democratic convention in Milwaukee. However, I won't make you weigh in on that, Amy. Um, uh, uh, James, Amy uh, knows this stuff, but we're going to have to have her back as we get closer to this idea of a I broker would love convention. That. Yeah. Before we go, Amy, though, tell just just for a second, tell us a little bit about some of the great stuff the Sign Institute is doing here, because it's on politics and public policy. It is. And I, and I think for me, you know, we always talk about that 360 degree view of the policymaking process. We all know the private sector, public sector, nonprofits, journalism and academia all influence the process. So the Sign Institute's a university wide um, initiative that helps to bring those voices on campus to share ideas about how they influence the process. We have a fellows program every spring that comes in practitioners who are experts in their field, build a seminar series. We're going to be doing research and training and building coursework to try and help you know, the biggest thing for me is that public service matters. This process matters. These things we all fight for matter. And so helping students and helping, you know, interested parties understand the process, how it's influenced and how you can use your voice in different ways um, and trying to show consensus building and collaboration. There's examples from the past of where we've come together to do it. And so we're trying to bring people together to, to make progress for the future, too. Well, in the uh, spirit of the Democratic candidates, uh, you know, what's your website? How do people get a hold of you? Um, it's just auscienceinstitute.edu, um, I think. And we certainly are on every social media channel. So, like, we, please follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn and, you know, Instagram and certainly Twitter. Um, we want to share some programming and ideas and we want to know what people want to talk about as well. I think it's important. There's a lot of issues out there. And I think we can co- find consensus on some of them. All right. Go, go to it. You've heard that. And, uh, James, uh, before we go, I also would point out that the AU American Eagles, the men's basketball team, is 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 on. They got a winning record now, James. They got Lafayette and Holy Cross coming up. They could end up, uh, you know, with a good record. Or John Feinstein might write a book about it. Exactly. We got to we got to get Feinstein. Yeah, you got the Bucknell uh, Lehigh AU game. My God. Right. If, if Feinstein comes, we got to come here with him, uh, James. And and I don't know. Do we call them the Lady Eagles? It's the it's the women's basketball team. Yeah, the women's team, basketball. Who was in the NCAA tournament a year Absolutely. or so ago? They've had a rebuilding Absolutely. year. Year, but they could come back this weekend too. So That's right. go you're, Eagles, go! You're both invited to any game when you're on campus. Uh, we'd love to love to host you. So great! Thank you very much, Amy Dacey. Thank you both. Well, good show, James. And you know, uh, for all those people who say how strong Trump is and. It's, a t- it's totally bogus. The only question is whether the Democrats uh, are strong enough or uh, smart enough to be able to take him on. But this has been proven anew by the way he's handling this kind of virus. He has no idea what he's talking about. He has inept people in place. He has Republican senators like John Kennedy uh, of, of your home state of Louisiana, Richard Shelby of Alabama, who are just raking this administration over the coals because, you know, if you have an epidemic, a pandemic, it doesn't stop at blue states or red states. And when you look at this administration and you look at Alex Azar at HHS, former Ken Starr prosecutor, a drug company executive compared to Sylvia Burwell in the Obama administration, or you look at that, whoever the clown is, is the acting secretary of Homeland Security versus Jay Johnson. If this crisis really, really becomes big, James, Donald Trump and company are ill-prepared. Well, first of all, the sheer stupidity of the Homeland Security uh, director, who said that it had the same death rate as normal flu. Normal flu has a death rate of one-tenth of one percent. 
We don't know, but we know it's at least 2%. It's probably going to be higher because the China and cases in, in that. So it's only 20 times more. And he's only the director of Homeland Security. Uh, so, I, 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 but it, it's, of course, it, it's breathtaking and it was expected. I thought one of the really bad things about last night, but they didn't bring it at one question. Bloomberg at uh, hour seven did something and finally asked the question at hour 23, but it was more discussion as really yeah. Palestinian conflict. No, I, I, I totally agree. And Trump uh, is going to have a news conference uh, 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 tonight, Wednesday night. Uh, but he doesn't know anything about this. He doesn't care anything about it. He said uh, when he was over in India, it's going to go away in a few days. Uh, you know something? It's not. Uh, I mean, imagine it's going to go away in a few days. And then the, I, the one thing, I'll make a prediction, James, a bold prediction. Trump will say, it's not my fault. Well, of course he's going to say it's not his fault. <laughs> and, and, and based on what I've read, I admittedly I'm hardly a virologist or anything like that, it's not the kind of thing that goes away with warm weather <laughs> at all. It's not, it, at all. It's not like having a cold or something like that. It, people jam it. And, it, and it's airborne. It's, it's really different. Than, uh, Ebola, Ebola, I know something about. And it never was much of a chance that Ebola would be a big deal here because it was very difficult to transmit. You had to literally have contact. I mean, in pretty serious contact with someone to catch Ebola. And this is airborne. And I think this particularly frightens pandemic people. I really do. Yeah, it does. And but, uh, you know, once it, you know, what it really shows anew is that this the, the incredible incompetence of this administration. There are posts that are not filled. I, well, I'll i bet anything that over the last 48 hours that Donald Trump has not been in touch with Tony Fauci, who is, you know, one of the great experts on stuff like this. They don't really care unless there's a crisis, then they'll blame it on someone else. But this is big stuff. This is serious stuff. Uh, and uh, I just hope all of our listeners out there uh, get a flu shot uh, and 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 be prepared for it. I don't want to you know create a scare, but I think that's what the experts are telling us. Yeah, it, it, let me go back. And I thought that Biden ha- had a very good la- night last night, and I was very clear about that. It, so he says the CDC and the NIH. Okay, we know what the CDC is, and we know what the NIH is. Ninety percent of the people in the United States don't. And if you say that there's a center of communicable disease that has, you know, been very effective and we're underfunding that and we're underfunding health research at the National Institutes of Health, you're just going to be more effective in communicating that. I mean, we just become so accustomed to, uh, what do y'all call it, the alphabet soup. And I, I thought he, it wouldn't have mattered much, but I, I just, in, in terms of communications, I think he could have been clear with people. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about, a little bit more about Trump before we go. Anything else, uh uh, that he's done that's outrageous other than, uh, you know. Not... Yeah, every time, every time he takes a breath. Well, outrageous. that's true. And, okay. of course, yeah. you know, he identifies with Modi over in India because they're both, you know, authoritarians. And so uh, – uh, and, and the one th- – I, I give Modi great credit. The one thing these foreign leaders knew is, no, is if you, if you pull out all the stops, you have 100,000 people in a cricket stadium. You have all kinds of festivals. People say, you're the greatest. This guy believes it. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, he'll give away the store if he has to. Yes, yes. Any 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 vanity event that you put on for him is great, and he'll he'll give the whole country away for that. that you're, you're absolutely correct. But I, there's nothing. You know, I've always kind of been this. Everything he does is an outrage. So it's just it's, all you can do is just go on and on and on. But no, he doesn't know. And it's not the fact that he doesn't know anything. I don't think anybody around him knows anything. Not even close. And, I mean, if you go through this, the entire cabinet, it, you get no sense of confidence about anything from anyone, particularly the people in senior levels that have to deal with a, with a pandemic. Um, I just got a text from John Barry. He wrote the definitive book on the, uh, the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And she says it's inevitable. It's coming. So, so. You know, and who knows? People might not be able to. I, I have no idea. I don't want to scare anybody because I don't know. But I, I know enough that I'm sort of reading everything that I hear. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when the Ebola crisis hit, uh, the Obama administration 
uh, put Ron Klain in charge of it. And um, I wasn't sure that was the right thing to do. I wonder if maybe they should get a general or something. I was wrong. He did a fabulous job. Uh, that was didn't have, didn't have nearly the effect uh, in the U.S. that this could have. But they really dealt with it seriously, and they dealt with it systematically, and they dealt with it with competence and people who knew what they were doing. I have, I just, I, I would, I, I have no doubt that that will not occur this time in a, in a, in a more serious situation. Of course. You know, and again, I, I, I'm not, I have no medical knowledge at all. I barely understand a virus. But the Olympic Committee is actually keeping an eye open that they might have to cancel the Olympic Games in Tokyo. I mean, that's how serious some people think this could get. Think, digest that for a second. Well, that uh, if, if, if the International Olympic Committee does something right, that'll be something new. Uh, but uh, uh, that does show you the dimensions of this. Right. I mean, and they're admitting it. I mean, yeah. you know, the senior people on there, I know a little bit about this because I tried to help a guy get elected. Of course, we lost. But. I know a little bit about the workings of that, but I mean, the fact that, that anybody just brought bought this up and, you know, look, I, I hope Trump is right actually in this instance. I hope it just goes away in two days. But I, Well, a broken think, clock is right twice a day. Yeah. This could be I the time, right. but I, you know, but be, I, but I, I, I kind of doubt it. Not, yeah. Listen, we have, um, we had a good show today and, uh, wow, the next couple of days, by the time we're on the air next week, uh, not only will South Carolina have taken place, but Super Tuesday, 14 states, 16 venues, one third of the delegates. Uh, you know, we I, I doubt it, but we could be talking about uh, the the virtually certain nominee by this time next week. Let's hope not. We might be. Uh, anyway. All right. Have a great weekend and celebrate. Uh, I, I get. Are, right. you, are, are you still celebrating Mardi Gras? Yeah, no, when Mardi Gras is Ash Wednesday, it's not, it's not cool, but I'm still celebrating LSU. <laughs> <laughs> and Zion. All right, James, thanks. Have a great weekend. Hey, thanks for listening. We cover the waterfront today. This was a great 2020 Politics War Room show, and please subscribe, rate, and review, be generous, the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you can get your podcast. For James Carville, I'm Al Hunt. We'll talk to you next week when over 35% of the Democratic delegates will have been chosen. Wow. Have a great weekend.